And that's why All you right. never use a pickle. <laughs> that's great. And I hope no one missed the first part of that sentence. <laughs> um, welcome to the Lovecraft Easing Podcast. Today is July the 23rd, 2017. And no guest today, as was planned. We do that every once in a while. Um, Matt, you have a prize, don't you? Yes, I do. Um, it is really a great one, I think. I happen to have an extra copy of a hardcover Call of Cthulhu campaign uh, from Arc Dream. It is the Sense of the Sleight of Hand Man. It's a full campaign, probably best for experienced gamers, but anyone would love to have this. It's full of gorgeous art and uh, um, wonderful descriptions and maps. Uh, I think anyone would be pleased to have it in their collection, in, in particular if you're interested in role playing. Um, it is really a nice book. Okay. Uh, the um, person who wrote it was Dennis Detweiler, so you know it's uh, got uh, good credentials for Call of Cthulhu. Well, I'll tell everybody how they can win that a little bit later. And by the way, it's not just the live viewers who can win prizes on this show. If you're listening to the podcast anytime in the next week from July 23rd, um, you're eligible for that. So uh, let's do introductions. Kelly, let's start with you. I am Kelly Young. I am the executive editor of Strange Eons Magazine. Matt. I'm Matt Carpenter. We're still pecking away at uh, Pickman's Gallery. Pete. I'm Pete Rollick, and I drive a Hyundai. <laughs> uh, this is not a support group. I forgot to. <laughs> Rick. Rick Ray, and I'm a writer. All right, and I'm Mike Davis, the Lovecraft Easing guy editor, publisher. Um, so Rick has a topic. We'll get to that in a few minutes. Uh, Cthulhu Wars figures. You want to talk about those, right, Rick? Right. Uh, is this from the, are these, we'll, we'll circle around back to this, but are these the, this from the original game or an extra uh, or an add on? Were you able to put together a slideshow? A slideshow? Was I supposed to? Well, I, uh, we could show. I was hoping we could show the images. Oh, I thought you meant you were hold, going to hold up the uh, the figures to the screen. No, no, because it, these are new ones. Oh no, no, I didn't do that. Sorry, I misunderstood. Can we still um, talk about them? You know what? I can. Uh, I can look them up, and we can. I can print them on the website as we go. All right. Um. Kelly, what? I got to make a salad. I, I can send you an email, Matt. Okay. What does that even mean? Kelly just wrote, I got to make a salad. Um, all right. So you guys saw the Stranger Things 2 trailer? Pete, did you see that? Yes. Yes, I did. All and right. So what did you think? I think it'll be the best uh, sequel to Ghostbusters ever. <laughs> Um, you know, I like, as I've said before on the show, I liked the first season, but I thought it dragged on a little bit more than it should, but I have to say, I'm pretty excited about the second season. This trailer is awesome. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it. Um, I, I like the pacing of the first one, um, but I only watched it once. So maybe it doesn't stand up to rewatch. But yeah, I'm definitely going to watch it again before uh, October. So I'm, you know, primed all the gray cells. I, I certainly think that the, um, what's the contents of the trailer cannot be construed as spoilers in my mind. Right. You know, we all talked about the uh, Lovecraftian element of an alternate dimension in some kind of nameless thing. Okay, well, there is some very Lovecraftian imagery of monstrosities floating in the sky reaching down with tentacles. Yeah. yeah. So even though there's going to be more homage to, you know, Michael Jackson and Thriller and Ghostbusters, I think there's, there, 
this just shows uh, a pervasiveness of Lovecraftian imagery in modern uh, suspense horror. Yeah, I wonder exactly what they are going to do, but it does look very Lovecraftian from the poster, from the trailer. You know, and season one was, as you said, somewhat Lovecraftian with the uh, the other dimension, the upside down, right? That's what they called it. Right. What do you think of the trailer, Kelly? Uh, I loved it. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. But, I, you know, I will sometimes go back and listen to Michael Jackson's Thriller album and go, oh, this is really good. <laughs> well, you're not so the I, only one. And then you I, go to a therapy meeting, right? Right. <laughs> I, uh, I, I dug it as soon as the music kicked in and uh, watching the kids play Joust and Dragon's Lair and things like that. That's definitely my childhood. Dragon's Lair was the most overrated game. <laughs> I could never get past the first. It, it was awful, but it had that uh, that Don Bluth animation. Well, you see, it, it wasn't fun to play. Because if you got killed, you got killed right away. And it, Plus, it was fifty cents. Remember that? Yeah. <laughs> I used to, see, I used to play video games with my son, and, and the one I I liked all the ones where you had um, team ups like Spider Man and Hawkeye. Because then you learn teamwork and you get to fight all these great characters and it took you a while to get killed and lose your quarter. I don't know, I was terrible at video games, but I thought Joust was a lot of fun. And I liked seeing it on there. You know, even when we had it on our video game console, I don't know which one, I was terrible at it, you know? Um, my kids gave up on me in terms of like <laughs> hand eye coordination. How did Joust work? Because I never played Joust. They had these like giant ostriches who flew around on picking up eggs and trying to knock off the enemy rider. Yes. You were, yeah, you were basically jousting, but instead of horses, you were riding ostriches and then flying from level to level. Oh, that Nobody like... bothered to check that ostriches don't actually fly. <laughs> That's your whole problem with this, Pete. Mike, is this going about the way you thought this would start? <laughs> oh, you know, I just, I've learned a long time ago with you guys to just run with it. So. You never know what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, so we've established so far that Stranger Things 2 trailer looks great. Ostriches do not fly. So yeah. Check. Check. If, if, if you throw them out of a plane, they fly for a brief period heading down. <laughs> as God is my witness, I yeah. did not know that turkeys not fly. <laughs> the humanity... <laughs> Matt, when you get a chance, check your uh, email. I, I've got them up. Okay. So I will do what I can to try and put them up as you talk about them. All right, and so here – go ahead. I'm sorry. It's just – okay, for, we're going to talk about this. Kickstarter has Onslaught 3 of Cthulhu Wars. Well, we're going to talk about it in a minute, but go ahead, yeah. Okay. Well, it's just – if you never got in on this, you can go in now and get everything – for a lot of money and if you just want to get the new stuff that's possible too you can also pick and choose wait a second are you saying that it is possible to just get the figures if that's what you wanted um i don't know about that no no you, oh, okay but you could you could buy the core game and just one expansion or no expansion or you know different He's making everything available, and he's got some uh, package deal like he has. Like, I, I'm going for the one which is this all the new stuff. But, you know, you, you can put together your own little uh, package. I see. Or, or, you know, pick one of his bundles and, and then just add a couple of things to it that maybe yes. you want. It's a bargain at $150. <laughs> Jesus. I don't have $150 to spend on At the moment, I don't either. So, all right, so this book, The Peasley Papers, A Lovecraftian Chronicle by Peter Rollick, will soon be available, published by uh, me, a.k.a. Lovecraft Easing Press. I've never heard of him. This is, yeah, I don't, it's nobody. It's, I don't uh, know. It, uh, how many stories is this? 22? 20? Yeah, 22? I think it's like 120,000 words. Yeah, yeah. yeah, this is, this is a, somewhat thick yeah. book and uh 
Great cover by Raven. It's um, girthy. Can you hold up the cover again? Yes, here you go. The Peasley Papers, of Lovecraftian Chronicle, Peter Rollick. So is that a great, uh, great, great race of Yith on the cover? It is. Yes. It is. Yes. There's the back for those watching. Um, and you know, this will be available, I'm thinking sometime this week. Uh, we're, we're, we should be able to have it at Necronomicon if you want to go there and get a copy there instead and have Pete sign it. Uh, or if you want me to just sign Pete's name, we can do that too. Yep, you have full authority. Okay, I have, I have power of attorney when it comes to signing a signature on books. No, you can get Pete to sign that. Uh, this is a this is a good book. This is great. Um, <laughs> uh, the the Yith have have always been with us, and so have the Peasleys. Peter Rollick presents twenty two tales of cosmic horror, detailing the further exploits of H. P. Lovecraft's. Peasley family, their ancestors and descendants. So damn, it, it, you make it sound good. I know, right? That's why you pay me the big bucks. You, you have the story about his wife in that one. Yeah, I've got. Um, there's there the one that that Mike published, um, the time, time traveler's traveler, ex-wife, right. and then a sequel, direct sequel to that. Um, Hannah and her mother take a very long lunch. Um, a very overlooked character. Yeah, and I you think know, I'm uh, glad you wrote it. Yeah, I I like Alice Kizar. Um, I have to thank um, Dave Goodsward uh, for cluing me into why she's named what she's named, and uh, hmm. I I had not realized the connection um, until much later. And, uh, yeah, um, I, I really enjoyed writing this book. It's, it, I didn't plan on it. I just realized that, you know, at one point I had like 50,000 words of Peasley stories dealing with, you know, Alice and Hannah and, and, um, Dora. Um, and then I just wanted to, to fill it out. I, I can't imagine being a Lovecraftian and not wanting this book. Yeah. I, I, yeah. uh, all kidding aside, Matt doesn't want. It. <laughs> yeah. and, you, and you go, Matt, you go all the way from the past, from the ancient past to the far future. Right. Yep. I yeah. Right. It starts in let's say uh, the Mesozoic somewhere around there, and and ends up with the heat death of the universe. Yeah. Um, so all the way to the end. <laughs> yeah. Spoiler alert: the universe is not going to make it, folks. Nope. Nope. Um, well, actually, in another story, Herbert West uh, reanimated it. Yes, the C.J. Henderson story. Um, well, I think it was actually some. Was it? Was it? Uh, was it Michael Cisco? Yeah, I think Michael Cisco actually wrote it. Right. You're right. Anyway, C.J. Henderson just didn't come back from reanimating the universe. Right. <laughs> Well, this will be available on Amazon for print and Kindle. Okay. Um, Kelly, are you watching the comments on the, the live comments on YouTube? I am. Okay, good. I forgot to pull that up on my laptop. Um, all right. So, yeah, for a few measly dollars, this joy can be yours. Thanks, and then Kelly. Cha Chaosium sent me this, the two-headed serpent, an epic action-packed and globe-spanning campaign for Pulp Cthulhu. This is pretty awesome. Um, and they also sent me oh, the Grand Grimoire of Cthulhu Mythos Magic. How about that? Well, that's cool looking. Yeah, isn't it? Yeah. Um, realize mo the majority of the people listen to this show, but Take our word for it; it's pretty cool. Uh, you can you can get this at Chaosium's these at Chaosium's website. I don't have a direct link, but maybe Google those titles with Chaosium, or just go to their website and search. That would probably work as well. Now, those books are specifically designed for the Call of Cthulhu game, right? They're not books of fiction. They're Correct. supplements, aren't they? 
Yes. Right. Okay. Campaigns like uh, Mad Hat before. Okay. So what 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 is the book? Is the book of magic really magic tricks? <laughs> so well, I think they work. They work. Yeah, you just have to have a lot of faith when you you do it. You're pulling the scarf out of the sleeve. Well, you know, our old friend James Henderson Harrison rather was telling us about that there were magic tricks he could do to, that he used to do to make play Cthulhu appear or something. Yeah, and he That'd got be better the, than the Statue of Liberty disappearing. He's doing a performance at um, Necronomicon. Ah, yes. Okay. So we can look forward to James Harrison doing real Cthulhu magic. Uh, all right. Justice League, do we like the trailer, guys? Overall, yes. Yeah. Overall, yes. Is there something you didn't like about it? No, uh, but I'm just, I don't have as much faith in DC that I have in Marvel. But yeah, but maybe, I'm, maybe, maybe I'll be proven wrong. There seems to be a lot of origin story packed into this movie that we haven't had yet. Well, they did find with Wonder Woman, um, and hopefully they'll repeat that this year. Uh, and then I see this the slate of DC movies coming up in the next few years. One of them is <laughs> the Flash's movie titled Flashpoint. Yeah. Now, it's really the only thing I have a problem with so far because I'm getting a little tired of Flashpoint, to be honest, at this point. We had well, the comic. Yeah, considering yeah. they have they have uh, mined that for the TV series also. Yep. Not only that, there was an animated movie. Yep. That's right. How Which many was times are we really going great. to do Yeah, the animated movie is great, but I really hope they don't do this and I, what I really hope they don't do is a soft reboot of, of DC uh, DC Universe's uh, film series because like, picture this oh. let's Wonder Woman was great let's say Justice League is fantastic just for the sake of argument okay and the next couple of movies are fantastic and then we get to Flashpoint you got everybody excited about all these movies now and now you want to reboot that's not a good idea is that what Flashpoint did in the comics? Is that where the reboot yes. of the New 52 started? Exactly right. Ah, okay. okay. If they do it like the animated movie, it just could be some interesting things like uh, the way Batman, Wonder Woman, and Aquaman would be handled. You know, I, I just, I guess I can't get all excited about it because Marvel does this all the time. We've had two versions of Fantastic Four, three versions of Hulk. This is our third Spider-Man. And they they kind of have the same movie. Well, it wow. depends on if you're a general superhero fan or you're a big DC fan. I think if you're a big DC fan, you're looking forward to all this, and you don't yet have superhero movie fatigue because you haven't really seen much of DC yet as, as, up to this point. And sometimes you can have different takes. Like I think the current Spider-Man movie, the big thing I got out of it was we're getting rid of incredible tragedy for a while because the yeah. emphasis is you know i mean the spider-man saga's high points are tragic but you can you get it you were getting too much of that in one dose one continual dose rather than have the fun of spider-man yeah this was yeah. a fun this was a fun movie you know what also set it apart was um there was none of that uh city destroying going on so you didn't have a a gigantic issue that he had to deal with. He was he was you know one on one with the vulture, and that was nice and refreshing. Well, yeah, and and that that doesn't go into the whole problem I have with when you have apocalyptic or city threatening events, and no other heroes show up. Right, right. Also, it was really set in Queens. Yeah. And the other thing is that issue of no other hero showing up is addressed yes it is there is one scene yeah yeah i i saw that the box office dropped after a week or two on spider-man and it was i really liked the movie as well i'm right with you guys on it but i yeah at this point there's got to be some spider-man fatigue well I, I don't know mike it's like i i guess this is me just thinking about movie going in general 
I'm thinking 20 some years ago when I used to go before I had kids and it was a shared experience and there weren't cell phones and there weren't individual screens and not much in the way of home theater and you barely had a VCR and you go and you have this experience with everybody and then you'd all talk about the movie like over pizza. I just went and saw Dunkirk which is kind of just opening I think and there are 30 people in the theater maybe you know it's like how that is not sustainable even at the amount they charge for popcorn and it's because people don't like being around people with cell phones talking on their cell phones or maybe they that's exactly it. right that drives me nuts you well, know, I guess you maybe they'd rather be ahead home. of you on a cell phone during the middle of the movie but, but maybe they'd rather be at home like eating their own food pausing it when they want to go to the bathroom you know they have a nice big screen TV. I don't know. Do you think the box office, domestic box office, is going to be anything as dramatic as it was in the past? When was the last time you had a triple platinum CD? It was like, I think it was Shania Twain in like 1998. Well, that's, yeah, the industry has changed so much in the music department that, that you're never going to see stuff like that anymore. But I think that you're absolutely right with the um, the fatigue of, of the theater going experience. I have long said that it, there has never been a better time to be poor in this country because everybody owns a gigantic TV. Everybody owns a halfway decent vehicle. And so you can stay at home. I've got, I bought a 46 inch TV for a hundred dollars this weekend. I mean, wow. Is That's that insane. Well, no, I mean it was it was used, but uh, I just needed a second TV, and this my second TV is bigger than my TV that I bought from the store, and quite frankly, it's nicer, and it cost me two hundred dollars less. <laughs> now I, I don't go to a lot of movies in the theater, but I I tell you what I do enjoy is going to the local drive-in. That's a lot of fun. Well, you so are you lucky that one? you still have a drive-in. Oh, <laughs> yeah. I know. Well, yeah. that's, the, that's the experience that you're sharing with your family and everybody there. Yeah. You know, the other thing to consider is that when we were kids and our parents took us to the movies, it was what, maybe twice, three times a summer? Now there's a new kid, kids movie every week. Well, yeah, wow. I was just going to say, consider that, you know, if it was a great movie, it stayed in the theater for six months. Yeah. Well, well it was so, the old, oldest guy here. My parents had a summer house in Queens in uh, Breezy Point. And we had a movie theater which played everything from like the whole year for like three days at a time. So I was going to the movies like every week. See, I when when we were down in on in the in the uh, the summer house to, on the on the beach, if it rained, you would on the second day you would get to go to the movie theater because you know mom's not popping out the money. Sure, you're on vacation. Get out yeah, and do something. Exactly. <laughs> well, we we would we we had like a a monthly schedule of everything that we're going to show. So we scheduled way in advance. We said, you know, we may not see the first day it opens, but we scheduled, we scheduled with my parents and saying, you know, hey, we want to see From Russia Was Love. Okay. Particularly my father was into that. He was, he was, he, he liked James Bond for reasons I didn't understand because I was too young as a kid. That was also fun when he watched movies like that and we're getting bored by the sexual uh, scenes and just want to get to the car chases. Well, as I said, I don't see many in the theater, but I, I'll tell you when I do go, I'm, I get tired of cell phones. You know, I just, I just think the, the fact that the box office is dropping for Spider-Man, even if it's a very good movie is not unexpected. I think yeah. there is a certain amount of superhero movie fatigue but I just think I don't understand how all these theaters are staying open with so few patrons. Well, you know, what was it? Uh, did you guys see World of Warcraft? No. I saw it on free on cable. Well, yeah. Free on cable. So, uh, you know, it tanked here in the U.S. 
but worldwide apparently it was a phenomenon. Yeah. It made a huge bank. Um and I think that's actually where a lot of this the the movie companies are making their money. Is overseas. They, and they, like movies, they like movies that translate easily that don't have a lot of cerebral complex dialogue. They yeah. like things that transform. Yep. Well, also the thing is now when I have to go to the movies, I've got to book my ticket in advance. Otherwise, I'm not sure I'll get a seat if 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 it's uh, you know a, a big blockbuster. You have less seats now because now you have these uh, chairs which uh, fold back. We got, we got reclining chairs now. You do? I don't in our theater. Yeah. That sounds awesome. Yeah, it's, so there are less seats because all the seats are recliners now. And you have to see ours, we have to actually reserve our seating. You have to pick your seat um, before you even go into the theater. And if, you, if you're going to see something like Spider Man, you better do that. You better do that on your computer at home. Because you, you're not going to, you mean uh, that you might find out the place is sold out if you show up there. Because every, every, you know, it could sell out based on computer sales. Well, I prefer yeah. home, but some you just don't want to wait for. I'm not going to wait for Justice League to hit home video. You know. And there hey, Matt, are some. I think, go ahead. Sorry. Oh, there are some that I think. I mean, there are movies that are designed to be seen on a big screen. I will go see a blockbuster on a big screen just because that's what you're there for is that surround sound and all of that stuff. Like I said, I went and saw Spider Man this morning. And we've got a really neat theater. I think that it's a chain, but if it's not, there's things like this. We've got something called Cinnabar, which is kind of a, a restaurant bar theater, and it's 21 only. So, I mean, I go and catch all the Disney movies there because no kids are allowed. And you can order your food. You get it served to you there while you're watching the movie, and it's a, it's a pretty cool experience. Um, but then if it's, if it's a, a small indie film, I'm probably going to wait to see that at home. Yeah. You know, I, I kind of want to go see Valerian in the theater, but I have this feeling it's going to be as terrible as Jupiter Ascending. Man, the reviews have been harsh. The reviews or effects are great and dialogue is horrible. Yeah, well, in, at least in Jupiter Ascending, they had like, what is it, uh, Tatum Channing, or is it Channing Tatum? Channing dressed, Tatum. Yeah, dressed like a dog rollerblading through space. It's Channing Tate and Grandpa Carpenter. <laughs> well, you look at that role and tell me you don't think it would have killed anyone else's career. Since, since we're talking about Channing Tatum, did any of you see the, uh, the, 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 the trailer for Kingsman 2? Yeah, that looks great. <laughs> that, that looks great. Well, the first movie, this, this one looks fantastic. I'm going to divert us to a movie that I think actually fits with our conversation. And has it actually, I think, stunningly beautiful trailer. The Shape of Water. Yes, I saw it. I just saw the trailer for that. That, that does look cool. Gorgeous. I haven't seen it. What's that about? That is sort of a, a uh, it's a Del Toro, uh, Guillermo Del Toro, am I getting his name? Oh, gosh, that looks wonderful. Yeah. It's like, a, it, 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 it's a modern take on the creature from the Black Lagoon in a way. Somewhat love craving. The government has gotten this um, gill man from South America as a prisoner and they're studying him. And a deaf mute attendant is finding out how to communicate with him and possibly falling in love with this creature. Yeah. Hmm. And that sounds good. Not only is the is the trailer beautifully done the uh artwork for the movie poster is just wonderfully gorgeous and, you know i have an entire room of creature from the black lagoon stuff and this is going right in there with the other thing i'm getting next year so as soon as i can what's the other thing yeah uh, mallory o'mara our our dear friend has written a book about the woman who designed the 
creature. Oh, okay. You mentioned that last week. Yeah, that sounds very interesting. And it's I guess it's due out next year, but I, I've seen a, a little bit of it, and it's just stunning. Hmm. Well, Lots the, of uh, photos and all that? Yeah. The actor who seems to play the villainous government figure in uh, – the Shape of Water is the actor who played General Zod on uh, in Superman. Oh, Michael Shannon. Yeah, he, he's yeah. excellent. Yeah, he's a good actor. Loved him in Boardwalk Empire when he used to be on that. Uh, so, uh, Rick, do you have um, or Pete? Do you know the name of the book yet? Is it um? Is it like being proofed or anything? I don't know where where it's at in the stages. Um, she posted a whole bunch of stuff about it a few weeks ago. I'll see if I can find it, and I'll send it to you. More importantly, why did it take so long for a book like this to be made? Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> because you had to wait on Mallory. <laughs> Matt, we'll definitely have to do another video test with you this coming week because your, your mic still is a little bit fuzzy. But we'll figure it out. Uh, Rick, I watched the Night Strangler and the Night Stalker movies again this weekend for the first time in a long time. And they were way better than I even rem remembered. Now, did you ever see a movie called The Norlis Tapes? No. That was made as sort of a spinoff of The Night Stalker. It was uh, produced by Dan Curtis, who did the two Night Stalker movies, that he also did Dark Shadows. Had the same music. It starred Roy Thinnis, who used to be in The Invaders. Was a pilot for uh, a TV series. It was going to be a, a 90 minute on um, NBC, used to have that uh, those detective shows like Columbo, Mystery, NBC Mystery Movies. They were thinking of doing a supernatural cult detective. It was going to be Roy Thinnis was this uh, writer, newspaper writer who was researching the occult and mysterious dis disappears and leaves all these cassettes of strange things that happened to him. Hmm. And the plot was basically a reworking of Night Stalker, Night Strangler, in that there's this zombie killer running around killing people, taking their blood, but not drinking it or using it for weird experiments, was trying to make a statue of an elder god. Really? And this, once the statue is completed, it will come to life. More, more, human, it, it, more, more of a humanoid elder god than uh, yeah. or a demon. They might, I think they might have referred to it as a demon. It had a very Lovecraftian name, Sargoth, in the show. Hmm. But that I know that I have it on DVDs, so uh, it's probably still available. But that was something to check out. And the name again is the Norlis tapes. Norlis tapes. N O R L I S S. Okay, yeah, I'll check that out. But you know, I would have said that I preferred the series to the movies before this weekend, but I changed my mind again. The movies are just spectacular. Although I think the movies are much better, yeah. much better than the TV series. Uh, I mean, there's a couple of episodes in the ser series that I just love. Uh, Pete and I was talking about they have been, they are, they shall be. Yeah, I like that, that one. Episode. I mean, I, I, I love the TV series, but the first two movies, just in terms of they, they had better music. It was done by the same composer who did Dark Shadows. Robert Corbett. Uh, it had better scripts because they were both written by Richard Matheson. Yeah. And just the first one just had incredible, I mean, it was so innovative when it first came out. So anybody listening, I mean, it's uh, 1972 and 1973, I believe. Um, Night Strangler, or excuse me, the Night Stalker is the first one, and the Night Strangler is the second one. If you haven't seen them, you should definitely check them out. 
Yeah. Um, the Night Strangler, if I remember correctly, yeah. um, takes place, uh, or not takes place, but a big chunk of it happens in the underground city in Seattle, right? Yes. That's right. Yeah. Uh, that was always a disappointment to me because then when I took the tour of the underground city, you know, <laughs> it, it's not nearly that fucking cool. <laughs> Didn't no, match up to your expectations. Not quite. I was like, where are all the stranglers at? There was an unproduced script by Matheson for a third movie called The Night Killers, which would have been in Hawaii and would have had some weird thing with space aliens and I think killer robots. This, I, I, I was just, after, after you sent me that email, I was researching that. And they, they, because Moonstone Books is going to come out with a novelization of the screenplay. The original screenplay was uh, reprinted, but the, the book containing it is like 200 bucks. So I'll wait for the novelization, which is going to come out in October. Okay. But, uh, I've, always, I've always loved um, the Kolchak series. Um, yeah. I can remember watching that as a kid. But you know, and you know the 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 energy eater, with the the thing underneath the the hospital. That's just so Lovecraftian. Yeah, yeah. And then, Ancient Indian god. Yeah, and then the sentry, or yeah. the sentinel. Yeah, that's that's so cool. Um, and it, you know, if you're, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, they borrowed from Robert Block's Jack the Ripper. Yep. Blatantly. Yep. Um, and I swear that Mr. Ring is a dry run for Blade Runner. <laughs> I didn't care for Mr. Ring. But it's, it, it, it's right there. It's, I mean, it's the, it's the same names. Hmm, really? Was yeah. it, was a short story that uh, Blade Runner was based on? I don't know. Yeah. Dream of Electric Sheep. Yeah. yeah, which wasn't very short. No. Um. And really, let's be honest. Never answers the question. No. <laughs> yes. That's a joke, Kelly. You're supposed to laugh. Spoilers. Yeah, yeah being spoilers. a good Ed, Ed Android, McMahon today, I'll tell Android's you that. Dude, dream of electric. <laughs> <laughs> you are correct. You are correct. Uh, you are correct, sir. <laughs> the best. So, episode, yeah, go ahead. Rick, the Rick, best Rick, episode Rick. was Horror in the Heights. Yes. Awesome. I yeah. was about to ask you guys what are your what's your favorite episode? Yeah. I would. That's a damn that. good episode. And as a monster that nobody had really ever heard of. Right. At least, and it hadn't been done that way. Because later I discovered some stories in Weird Tales where they actually Paul Wilson later did a version of that in the tomb. Mm -hmm. First Repairman Jack story. Right. They were called he, the well, he has a whole novel called Rixasa. Uh Well, th that's right up there with They Have Been, They, they Are, They Shall Be. With, those are my two favorite episodes. Yeah. I don't know which one I like more, but they're both fantastic. Same with you guys. I, I'm assuming. I, you know, I like I like horror in the heights. I like they are they were they are they shall be. Um, but if I if when I sh sit down and show somebody an episode, it's the energy eater. I, I just think that's a really good episode. Okay. I really like the doppelganger one too. The one was the fire. Oh yeah, because that when I saw that, that was also like, oh, I never heard of this concept before, and that's why you know I liked it when they went a little bit away from vampires, zombies, and werewolves. I was under the impression that the Trevi collection was your favorite, absolute favorite. I like the Trevi collection because I'm a Dark Shadows fan, and I like Laura Parker. Okay, but. If you look at it as a uh, the way it's directed, the mannequin scenes could have been done better. Yeah. But I mean, uh, for her performance lifts the, the episode. 
so Rick, you want to talk about Cthulhu Wars, correct? Right. All right. Is uh, Matt ready? What are you going to do? Put him on the message board, Matt, when he talks about him? Matt's too busy playing with his dolls. Uh, I think they're I'm figures. Right. Figure they're figurines. They're figures. They're action figures. They're not dolls. Have some respect. Matt's too busy playing with his dolls. Uh, no, I'm getting some kind of weird echo. Like the show's playing twice. They're figures. They're action figures. Uh, hit your mute button. I think you've got the show playing on another browser. Yeah, I just think, okay, good. You're having all kinds of technical difficulties today. It's just because I'm an <laughs> We could convince Matt to put some headphones and a microphone on. That would all be solved. Weird. I can't be cool like you, even if I try. Well, you, like you, might, really you might have to do it if we can't. A pair of headphones. You might have to so do it if we can't figure out this uh, microphone thing, because you are fuzzy. They have pairs that have little cat ears on them, Matt, if that would make you happier. I think they come in hot pink as well. If you're... Well, the thing is, I got upset and my son took them and they're vanished now. No. All right. So, yeah, go ahead, Rick. You've got the floor. All right. Uh, if Matt can't show the images, I'll just describe them. I'm going to po try and post them on the web page. All okay. right. Well, why don't you hit your mute button, Matt? All right. Fine, I don't want to talk to you either. No, you, you can listen. All right, there's an add-on called the Ancients, which is actually, uh, it's, it's a, they have these factions. Normally these factions are led by a great old one. There are currently eight factions. Cthulhu leads one, Shabnagurath leads one, Nihalatotep leads one. You get the drift. Mm-hmm. Um, but last uh, Kickstarter, they had a faction called the Show Show People, where you did get a great old one, but it was a certain was Ubo Sathla from Clark Ash and Smith, but it was a servant of the humanoid Show Show People who live in Burma and Tibet in the Cthulhu mythos, and are sort of deranged little dwarfs. And now we got the Ancients, which it has no great old ones at all, and ties into the mound, Lovecraft's revision for Zia Bishop. And what you get is every faction has a group of uh, acolytes. You get five acolytes they're also called cultists and generally they all look the same they were there they're a person in robe and it was originally done so you couldn't tell whether it was male or female reading a book with sort of a hood over the head and you can't really see the features and i think if you look very closely it may look like the person is the cultist is wearing a mask and when they did the Chow Chow people, they replaced that standard cultist with a uh, Chow Chow character holding a skull. And they've done this with the ancients where you get an inhabitant of uh, the civilization in the mound, which is dressed in armor with goggles and it's and the character seems to be holding um, some device shaped like an eyeball. And one thing interesting about the figure is you can't tell whether it's male or female. It, there look, seems to be a breastplate that indicates that it's female, but maybe that's just the design of the armor. And the ancients those you you get the cultists first because that's if you play the, if you I'm not going to go into all the rules of playing the game but you got to start off with cultists up opening gates in the Cthulhu Wars. They have as their monsters uh, three monsters. One is a uh, they're all based 
well, two of them are based on the fact that there was these creatures in the mound called yim, yimbies. It was sort of like zombies, which uh, they were doing experiments with reanimation, which is something Peachy later investigated in one of his stories. So and one of those one of those, those things shows up in um, the Peasley papers. Okay. And the, the the he has two classes of of these yimbies. These one is called the unmen, and it looks it looks like some grotesque caricature of a human being with very thin body, very thin arms, sort of a grotesque version of, of Mr. Fantastic on the Fantastic Four when he used to stretch, or Plastic Man. And the other one is called the Reanimated, and it's a living corpse, somewhat skeletal, with pieces of machinery attached to it. So it's got like these pile driver arms. And the third monster, the ancients lived in a region called Kenyan, which was blue lit. And there um, was a neighboring region called Yoth, which uh, was lit by red light. And there were uh, evidence of some four-legged reptilian race living there, where you get a conception of a Yathian as a monster that the uh, ancients can control. And the uh, Yathian looks like some sort of demented reptile with about four, at least four eyes, Sort of a mutated combination of a lizard and a crocodile is the best way I can describe it. They also have, you get points in the game if once you unleash great old ones. Well, they don't unleash great old ones, they build something called cathedrals, which I don't think. The, the term cathedral appears in the mound, but I think they're based on the temples that they had to, the great old ones built by uh, the inhabitants of Kenyan. The ancients as a title, by the way, may come from Manly Wade Wellman, who used uh, the term ancients in his uh, John, the, the Silver John, the, the Ballader series. And now for the regular factions, for the, for, for the seven existing factions who had standard um, acolytes, you now have the option to get replacements of a unique figure for each Faction. So each great old one who leads a faction gets his unique set of worshippers. And there's some interesting choices here. For instance, Ithaqua, who uh, is a god created by all these girls that lives in the Arctic, is worshipped by guys who look like a 1930s version of Captain Cold from The Flash. They're wearing Eskimo-like or, 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 or Arctic fur coats that, you know, like that in the Miskatonic expedition they would have worn. He's got a belt and he's got those weird glasses with the slits that is sort of a mask for Captain Cold in the comics. And he's carrying a rifle. And if you turn the figure around, 
you'll see that there were skulls hanging from the back of the belt. Cthulhu gets a character which seems to be based on the Fisherman of Falcon's Point by August Durlitz. You get a uh, half-human deep one in a classic fisher New England fisherman outfit with like the Inverness style uh, raincoat and the flappy hat that all fishermen have. And he is holding a machine pistol. Uh, Hester, the unspeakable, and the king in yellow, who lead one faction together, get a woman who looks like a ballet dancer holding a book, which I assume is the play, The King in Yellow, and maybe based on Casilda from The King in Yellow stories. Naya Lothotep gets these uh, bald guys in Egyptian outfits Uh, like ancient Egyptian priests holding this huge staff with a circle which has the symbol that uh, Sandy Peterson used for Nia Lothotep's uh, faction. It sort of looks like a uh, an eye, a, a alien eyeball if, if you examine it or a reptilian type eye. Uh, Sash Segua from Clark Ashton Smith, the Toad God, also known as the Sleeper in Cthulhu War Game nomenclature, gets a group of guys who kind of look like I would imagine the Ibon or Ibon, the sorcerer, to look like in um, the Hyperborean stories. He's uh holding a knife way up in the air in ancient type robes, bald with a goatee beard. Yag so gets a um, woman who looks like a cross between Lavinia Waitley and Lizzie Borden in that she looks like some sort of rustic because she's wearing uh, those pants with the jeans that kind of like hillbilly style pants which have the shoulder things that hang down. And she's holding a huge ax. And she's got like a hairstyle like the Bride of Frankenstein. Uh, let me see, have I missed anybody? Sh oh, Shabnagura gets uh, female worshippers who one is wearing a skeletal goat head and has uh, bracelets with um, uh, chains on her hands and feet which is sort of a uh, nod to the sexual nature of what the rituals of Shabnagurat would be. Actually, that's my favorite little figurine of these acolytes. Yeah, that, that was the closest to what I, other than Casilda, as to what I thought an acolyte who worshipped a god would look like. And I want to see this. Yaksosa, Fisakwa, Sesakwa. I'm missing somebody. I did show the girls, I did Nihilatha, I did Cthulhu, I did Hester. Oh, Avathos doesn't have a faction. That's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking of eight. There are only seven that they do this for. They have, if you know the game, they have a uh, 
a faction. They have a faction for afterthoughts, but it's not played as a faction. It's like a series of neutral monsters. You can hide. That's why I thought there was a name for it. Now they're also going to have a feature called the um, Mass of Nihilothotep, where you get three different, four, at least three different forms of Nihilothotep. There uh, is probably going to be, they haven't announced it yet, there's going to be a stretch goal to make the Horner in the Dark a figure in the set. But what they have there is the first one is the Bloated Woman which was a character created for Call of Cthulhu gameplay. And it's the most grotesque looking character I could imagine. It's got a chrome-like head. If you ever saw the movie The Witches with Angelica Houston, that's what it kind of looks like, except it's fatter. It's this huge mound of flesh. And in the middle of the stomach is a gaping mouth. It's holding a fan, which looks like a Chinese fan, because I believe in the Call of the Bilu game, the uh, origins of the character in the Far East. Now, they have a character called the Shadow Pharaoh, which I think is based on uh, the, the monster in, in prison was the pharaohs, the Harry Houdini story that's also known as Under the Pyramids. It's, it's not the, you know, when we think of Niall Arthur as a pharaoh normally in uh, Dream Quest 1 Okinath, he was human. This, creek, this character looks like a cross between a centaur, a scorpion, and the creature from the Black Lagoon. From the waist up, it's got these webbed hands, sort of like the creature from the lagoon, and the face is, it seems to be like a classic creature from the Black Lagoon. And its body uh, was the four legs, like uh, the horse body of a centaur, is uh, scorpion style, and has a like a scorpion type tail and very stringy hands or paws, or, uh, or you might consider them feet, it's not, okay. But I always thought that this is supposed to be the monster from the Harry Houdini story. And they also have the Dark Demon, which is from Robert Block's story of the same name, which in the story was a, I had Nine Author Tip appearing as a version of Asmodeus, which had a um, head of a hog type creature and was furry and was claws. Now, the claws look more like uh, a crustacean, they're sort of like crab claws. And I really didn't see any fur on it. And that's a figure that's about the size of an acolyte. And the um, last two, two categories, they have this one called Cosmic Terrors Beyond Space and Time. They're going to have a version of the Hound of Zendalus, which is different from the Hound of Zendalus that was in the uh, Kickstarter for Richard uh, Luang, who did the artwork. Well, I think, I think it will have the same rules. That was like a special character created for Cthulhu Wars. And if you have that figure, that figure looks like a, um, a lean dog-like creature with uh, a very a, a head like the creature on um, Stranger Things, and a long tongue. Th this one has a head like the current one that they're offering in the Kickstarter, has a head like a, a the monsters in the Alien movies, 
and it seems to have a very spike, body full of spikes and spines with very long legs. They also have a creature called the, the vamp, if I remember correctly. And that's one of the most obscure creatures in Lovecraft's stories. It's mentioned in the dream quest of unknown Kadab as being the monsters that feed on uh, corpses in the dreamlands. The ghouls exist in the dreamlands, but the ghouls will not eat dreamland corpses. They, they, the ghouls in Lovecraft's story exist in their own graveyards that can cross over to the dreamlands. And this creature looks like a, an eyeless bat with nine uh, spidery legs. Or maybe seven, at least, at least, I'm forgetting the exact number of legs, but seven and nine legs. And actually that description was taken from a story called Clark Ashton Smith, by Clark Ashton Smith called The Abominations of uh, Yan Yondo. And that was in the original Cthulhu War Game. Sandy Peterson used to combine sometimes names from Lovecraft and creatures that were not described with monsters that various writers in the mythos created that uh, were, ne were never given a name. And he's also it hasn't been added officially yet, but it's a stretch goal that's probably going to be met tomorrow. There's going to be an eel-like creature called the Vern, the Vunuth, V-O-O-N-I-T-H, Vunuth, or, or Vuneth, I think is how you pronounce it. And that's also one of these monsters that's only mentioned once in the dream quest of Unknown Kadab. I don't think we've got a picture of that yet, right? Uh, if you, you, you've got it, if, um, I, I sent you one, it's the last one in the group. All right. You, it's not on the website yet, but it, it was in a, um, update that he sent back to Sandy. That's the one, the, the, no, the last one I have is something called John Dark. Oh, you didn't get one after John Dark? No, I only got the 21 items. Oh, okay. I will send you that. But, uh... Yeah, only 21. Jeez. <laughs> yeah, really, only. Well, I'll send you there's, that later. We'll send that later. There's, there's 22 days left in this Kickstarter uh, as of July 23rd, 2017. And yeah, I, you can Google Cthulhu Wars on and Kickstarter, and I'm sure it'll come up. Well, we'll just mention John Dark. John Dark is some figure that Sandy created originally. He's going to have a group of characters called Investigators, which are neutral figures, but you buy them and you, they're kind of like, you curse the one of your, the opposing player was having this uh, Investigator in their ranks, sabotaging all their missions. And it's a very weird looking character. He's got like a peg leg. He's carrying a, some weird looking gun. He's got two books of black magic strapped to his clothes, one hanging from his belt and one hanging from like his back. And he's got a uh, either a familiar or a malformed Siamese twin attached to his shoulder. So it's the most bizarre looking character I've seen that Sandy has offered. And the last thing I'm just going to mention is there is a category called, uh, or there is an expansion called Shagai. Now normally in Cthulhu Wars you fight on Earth, but in this case you fight in um, Outer space, and we, we they they've used planets from Lovecraft like Yaga in prior expansions. 
Shy Guy has the, uh, is the Lynn Carter version from uh, a short story he wrote called Shy Guy, in which uh, the planet in that case was being destroyed by a gigantic worm. He got uh, a series of worms, which, which the figures have worm-like bodies and vertical mouths like Venus flytraps. And that's the last thing I'll discuss. The, you can get in on a Kickstarter and get everything, but if you just want these new figurines, I believe it's $150 approximately, and it gets you any of these stretch goals that are met. Uh, yeah. it's, it's actually 199 because if you do the 150 you don't get the uh, acolytes. Oh, well. Because technically their replacement's not new. Oh, well. I'll pitch in uh, 40 bucks if somebody will give me the John Dark figure and the reanimated figure. <laughs> <laughs> so the figurines are, are the figures are really, really cool, but have any of us played Cthulhu Wars yet? Yes. That was going to be my question. Who who here has played it, and how do you like it? I saw the uh, I saw the test game at the Lovecraft Film Festival a couple of years ago, and it looked kind of fun. It, it is fun. I mean, it's like I played it with my son, so I got these sets, and my wife was like saying stuff to the effect that like, why aren't you using the things that you got? Um, <laughs> so I set it up on the kitchen table, and that uh, that engendered more comment. Um, at any rate, it's who fun. argued who argued we, to be the thimble and the Scotty is what I want to know. Now, since we didn't show any figures, here's Cthulhu in the standard okay. game. Um, well, the thing is, it, it, you have to read the rules. Yeah. So, so like one of my sons read the rules, and we sort of relied on his interpretation. Right. Uh, and naturally, he won both games. Matt, Matt is holding is holding Ran Tegab, who looks like a uh, sort of a Lovecraftian version of a hermit crab is the best way I can describe it. it. It is absolutely gorgeous. These these figures, I can't get over there. They they have substantial weight. Um, they're beautifully sculpted. If you were so inclined, you could do a master paint job on it and individualize it for you, but. I like them the way they are. Um, the game is actually quite fun. It moves pretty fast. You can be, if you understand what you're doing, you're done in about an hour. How long does it take to set up? Um, you know, not long to be honest. Probably ten minutes, maybe. It's like you oh, know when I tried bad. to play when I tried to play Arkham Horror. It's like two hours later, and I'm still trying to set up the board. Yeah, Arkham Horror is, is a difficult game. Um, and this one, you know, it was 30 minutes. We were ready to go. We played a game. We came back to the next day. We played another game. We had fun with it. A lot of trash talking and backstabbing and uh, <laughs> making alliances that no one stuck to. You know, the reason I'm showing Cthulhu is I forgot to mention there's going to be an alt version of Cthulhu you get from this game. It's called Dire Cthulhu. That one looks pretty cool, too. Which uh, basically has a shorter wingspan, but a larger, more armory body. It really looks cool. I'm really impressed with the scale of these things. These are big figures. They also kind of take up a lot of space. I was going to ask, I, I imagine that each one of these uh, expansions is another gigantic box, and pretty soon you're, you're stuck carting a suitcase around if you want to take this game to anybody's place. And some, right. of, the, some of the boxes hold up better than others. What, we, what I do is I have like four huge plastic bins that have my, a lot of Lovecraft memorabilia, but this is like I think two or three of them are dedicated to Cthulhu Wars. Um, so, Rick, didn't you have an idea for us to, you know, how we play Call of Cthulhu every once in a while on Google Hangout? Uh, like this. I know. I know. We're not into the really cool things like you are. Um, 
I think we had all had an idea to play this game once. Yeah, to play it, but, but I'm. I guess my question is: Is it realist? Is that realistic? I wonder. It's not like Call of Cthulhu where you're basically talking. No, we all we all need to show, we need to have somebody showing a board all the time. Or, or yeah. um, uh, everyone would have to have their board completely set up and make each move. Yeah, you know what? Just for that nerd remark, um, you're gonna have to play the next Call of Cthulhu campaign with us, Kelly. I won't have time. I've uh, I'm setting up a diorama with all the micronauts that Peter is sending me. So. Yeah, yeah. Like I said, you're into the really cool stuff. And it, 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 if you are into figures, you won't regret getting these just because the figures are so gorgeous. And if you've got a group of friends that come over to your house for gaming, you can have a really fun evening playing a couple rounds of this game. You can each switch factions, switch armies all the time. You don't have to play the same ones. If you get all the expansions, you end up with like seven or eight different armies. And if you have no friends, you at least have the figurines. Right. One thing you have to be careful of, I'm saying, was the box for Cthulhu Wars and the box for the uh, faction expansions hold up very well. But if you keep taking the figures out for some of the other expansions, like the great old one packs or whatever, those boxes are going to start to fall apart. So Why is that? Because the figures are like, they have their own little slots or something, and... and removing them regularly ruins that slot probably yeah Chub Niggeroth's tail fell off, fell off so it does a drag well it's not so much a slot it's just that the factions in the uh, core game are made out of a harder cardboard and the, the other uh, add-ons are, are thinner and the box starts to break open I had to use some Elmer's glue to uh, repair a few boxes. Well, what I'm wondering is if Sandy Peterson, uh, I know Sandy, I wonder if I email him and say, can you pay us ro retroactively for this half hour commercial on the Lovecraft Easing podcast this week? <laughs> <laughs> oh, you get lo lovely figures. Yeah, I just, God, I don't know. Most of us, let's be honest. Most of us, bought, I mean, I bought them for the figures. I'm not into gaming. Some someday I really like to play the game. I remember I was at Sandy's house before the first Kickstarter, and you know he was showing me artists' uh, representations of the figures and everything, and he was so excited about it. He was like a big kid talking about this stuff. Well, one thing they keep doing is they keep up. You know, you have some cardboard tokens of. Uh, like brain cylinders from Yaga, and they'll give you alt bits in uh, Kickstarters where you can replace those figures with uh, plastic three dimensional objects. So, like, uh, they had the Spider God from Clark Ashton Smith, who's saying Hyperborean stories, laying webs. Well, those were just little cardboard webs. Now you get webs. They had one of Ramsey Campbell's characters, uh, I Hort, uh, giving birth to these little white spider things. Well, now, now, now you have a, a, a little plastic uh, platform with these little spiders running around it. Uh, if you are interested, if you are listening to this podcast and you're interested and you are going to Necronomicon, you can sign up for free for some Cthulhu War games in the gaming session. Uh, last I looked, which was admittedly a couple days ago, uh, there are a few sessions left, not run by Sandy Peterson, but that hardly matters, um, where you can get in on an actual game and get your hands on the figures and check out the gameplay. If you don't get to sign up, but you're still pretty interested, I'm sure they wouldn't care if you dropped by and watched for a half hour or so, got a flavor for how it worked. I just think it's a lot of fun. You know, you can imagine if you have your friends over some Saturday and you're drinking a few beers, if you don't want to watch the football game, pull out the game. Uh, I had fun when I played it. Uh, well, here's a dumb question. Do you have to have at least four people or can you play with, play with three? 
I played with three. Okay. Um, you could play with two. Can you play it by yourself? If, for no, example, no, no, no. You absolutely no can. Yes. Well, that's where you say, "Oh, curse your sudden but inevitable betrayal." <laughs> uh, uh, Asking know, for a friend. Right. Some, some people have suggested that they do an add-on to have a one-player, you know, create rules for a one-player game. But the thing is, you can you can have up to seven. There's rules for like like board expansions where you can have more than four or five players. You can have up to eight. And, and it were, there were nine factions to choose from if you have everything. I, I think you know how Arkham Horror has a digital version? We need a digital version of Cthulhu Wars so we can play Cthulhu Wars. Um, it's actually, it, it, it's not Arkham Horror, right? It's. Uh, I thought it was Arkham Horror. No, 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 no. Um, uh, Is that Elder Sign? Elder, Elder Sign. Sign. I'm sorry. I'm thinking of Elder Sign. You're right. Uh, but yeah. uh, you can play this easily with three people, I mean, four people, and st and I think three three or four people would be ideal. More than that, and then it just gets to be, I would think it would get to be cumbersome waiting your turn. Well, I was just asking, because so, so I could play with Danielle and Logan, my wife and my oh, son. Oh, yeah, absolutely. We do, uh, I played with Ethan and Sam because nobody else likes me, um, and I pay for their food. <laughs> we, we like you. That's why you keep muting me. <laughs> that was an accident. <laughs> <laughs> we like you. We just don't want to hear you talk so much. <laughs> I got That's some fun for you. Uh, so, yes, 22 days left. Um, check out the Cthulhu Onslaught 3. Cthulhu it looks like they're going to hit their goal. <laughs> they might hit their goal, yes. They asked for 100000 and they're at, what, 560000 Something like that? It just, seems like I, a safe I, bet. It's already spent so much damn money on this game. It's another two hundred dollars. It's like, oh god, it just didn't hurt. There's, I, I wouldn't even have the base. I wouldn't even have the first one if if Sandy hadn't just sent me one for promoting it. it it's just too. Yeah, it's out we of my just, budget. We just had a serious conversation today about my budget or lack thereof. So, Pete, you get that email from me um, from a viewer, listener? Yes. Yes, okay. I did. Can you answer those questions or no? Can I read that email or do we need to do this another time? Boxers we need to do that another time. <laughs> we need to do that another time? All right. Yeah. We can do that. So, Okay. So, Shane, I'm not ignoring your email. Maybe we can take care of that next week. What oh, I got that book is gorgeous, Pete. Through a Mythos Darkly? Yep. It is a gorgeous book. You just get that? I just got my contributor's copy, yes. Oh, right. You're in that book. I am in this book. This was a take the mythos and reimagine the world through, that, through a mythos eye. And I, of course, had to do a reverse reanimator story. Stuart Bear Deanimator. <laughs> and I think it turned out really, really well. And this is this is a gorgeous book. Um, really high production value. Yes, publishing is great. Yeah. The only thing is they often don't have electronic copies. No, they right. don't. Once in a while. Once, yeah. And then Twice Upon Apocalypse. Lovecraftian fairy tales. Yep. It came out from Rachel Kenley and Scott Goodsward. Are you in that as well? I am in this uh, with a story called The Gumdrop Apocalypse. That's kind of fun. What was I that? Don't speak that language. You, you froze up a bit there, Matt. What was that? Oh, nothing. I just was wondering, is it? Purely mythos stuff. It is purely mythos stuff. It's it's mythos Lovecraftian fairy tales. Who's the publisher of that? The Crystal Lake. Yeah. All right. And then, of course, from our friend Salome, Haunted Future. 
Um, yeah, yeah, that's cool. This is a really good book. Um, uh, with stories by Warren Ellis and Jeff Noon, amongst others. So. That is really cool. I, I read through some of the stories in there. It's They're really good. And Warren Ellis, of course, is amazing. And if you're not reading Heavy Metal, he is now the... Uh, the editor in chief of heavy metal and most of the stuff in heavy metal is written by him and it just continues to blow me away. Yeah. And Peter Rollick is pretty good too. Yeah. Peter Rollick's okay. I'm, you know, Take him or leave him. it's a very different story than I'm used to writing. Um, <laughs> it's rough when your publisher says that. <laughs> <laughs> Take him or leave him. Uh, yes, that's a joke. Yeah, I'm not even sure my publisher reads my stuff anymore. I do read your stuff just because I didn't read it right when you sent it to me. <laughs> Sometimes that's pretty cool. I mean, I guarantee you Stephen King's publisher doesn't read his stuff. It's just like, let's make some money. <laughs> it's like yeah, I just think you're that good, Pete. I don't need to read it. It's, it's a Pete <laughs> Rollick book. It's going to sell. <laughs> yeah, someday somebody's going to open up a book. It's like, there's Pete's recipe for glumkies in here. I love it. It's a hit. <laughs> uh, hey, Kelly, why don't you talk to us about that new Kickstarter book that you just got? I got, and so did you, and I met with Nick Gucker, and he got his, so I'm assuming everybody got it. It's called Innsmouth, The Lost Drawings of Manish Sykovia, and it is so cool, way cooler than I even thought it was going to be. It is a sketchbook, but it's this gorgeous hardcover book with a lovely uh, dust jacket and all that. I don't know if everyone can see that. And for you listeners at home who are listening later, I'm holding up this amazing book. I don't know if this is available now as a mass market book after the Kickstarter or if it was only the Kickstarter, but it is just full of these amazing sketches that uh, that Mark Nelson did. And it's, it also tells a story. It really kind of pisses me off because I had something similar like this going on with Nick Becker. Um, <laughs> and then we both got this book and it was like, uh-oh, shit. But um, the sketches tell a story about the artist who is undergoing a change, it appears, through is his lifetime. Is that Mark lifetime. A. Nelson? Yes. Oh, shit. I've been, yeah, because he did a lot of the early work for the Dark Horse Aliens comics. Yes. And he did that one shot Silver Wing. I don't, I'm not familiar with that one, but I mean, if, if the, uh, if the upshot yeah. of all of this is that he's an amazing artist, you are absolutely right. Yeah, I was so uh, pleased when this showed up Yeah, and I don't, I don't even remember. I've done so many of these Kickstarters, but I must've got some level that came with, uh, extra prints and, um, signed postcards and things like that. It was such a, a neat presentation and, when it arrived, I, I was just like, holy cow, this is cool. I'm so glad I got in on this. So, Innsmouth, The Lost Drawings of Manish Sykovia, if you're into um, Lovecraftian art and sketching and stuff like that, then uh, you should search for this and see if it is still available. It's really cool. And yeah, I know that Matt got it. Uh, and you know, if Lovecraft artist Nick Gucker jumps in on something like this, you know it's gonna be good. Yeah, that's true. Um, Sometimes, you know, most of the time, remember when Mike Dubish did that Black Velvet Necronomicon book? Yeah. Way back, and it was absolutely gorgeous. Ultimately, he did release hardcover copies available to the general public. And I'm kind of hoping they're going to do that, but it's somewhere down the pike. I can't find any notification about it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, okay. Well, that makes sense, yeah, because for a while, Mike had them available, I think, only at conventions if you didn't get in on the Kickstarter, and now I think you can order it from his website. If I'm... I thought it was sold out. I thought it was out of print. Oh, Oh well, that's a bummer for you if you missed it because uh, Dubish's <laughs> art is also amazing. Well, next week, we're going to have the guys from the H.P. Lovecraft Historical Society. Not sure if we're getting one of them or, or two of them, but we'll have a well, Sean Branning at the very least, I believe. Um, and then we're 
what, three weeks away from Necronomicon? Yeah. Wow. I will be next week in Pittsburgh at Bulk Fest, so I may not make the show. All right. I am turning 50 next month. Next month or next week? For? What do you want, you whippersnapper? A cake? <laughs> I want beer. Since we, we should give a belated happy birthday to Joe Culver. That's true. Yeah, happy birthday, Joe, who couldn't join us. The last I heard from him, he was yelling at a female police officer and calling her sweet teats and ranting about how the Jews control Hollywood. So that might be why he's not here this week. What the hell what? are you talking about? <laughs> he just made that up. You know, this is how crap gets started, Kelly. This is, yeah, that's how rumors get started. Next thing you know, Joe's blacklisted. Well, hey, I'm just saying what I know, you guys. Joe, Joe would never do it. <laughs> unfortunately, think of a couple of people who might, but Joe would do one of them. All right, so we have anything else to talk about? Yeah, I got, um, if we're talking about stuff in the mail, um, we all love and know Cody Goodfellow. I got some cool Cody Goodfellow stuff in the mail. Um, the Snake Handler by Cody Goodfellow, G Cody Goodfellow and J. David Osborne. They are um, putting this out, uh, not through a publisher, but through their own pages. So look up Cody or J. David Osborne on Facebook, and you will see that. Um, and then this one from Dim Shores, The Polite Ones, which is Cody Goodfellow and art by Marcelo Galagos. And it is really cool. And I am currently reading, also from Dim Shores, Palladium at Night by Christopher Slatsky, and if you're familiar with Christopher Slatsky, uh, Electromancer and others, and he's just uh, one of these new guys that popped up, and you you know, like Fracassi and, and everybody else, you're just like, wow, where the, where the hell did this guy come from? So there's a lot of really cool stuff. It is a good time to be uh, a Mythos reader. If you want more Cody Goodfellow, there are still tickets available to the prayer breakfast at Necronomicon, which I'm assuming he's going to be running. You'll get some Cody Goodfellow there. That's all right. That's for sure. You get a big dose of Cody Goodfellow at the prayer breakfast. Yeah, What's the plate ones? Is that a collection? No, it looks like it is a, a complete short story. Oh, all right. Can you give us a little synopsis of what the stakeholder is about? I don't know yet. I haven't read it. It just arrived in my in my mailbox, and my uh, my to be read pile is so gigantic. But I can read if you like from the back. Yes. Yes. Let he who is without sin come get some. All his life, Reverend Clyde Hilburn has fought to protect his downtrodden flock in the tiny town of Palestine, West Virginia, from the evils of the modern world. To that end, he has held a monopoly on not only their souls, but also their thriving drug addiction. But times have changed, and forces larger than him have moved in to take control of both the church and the flow of narcotics. When he suffers a lethal bite from a rattlesnake someone placed in his mailbox, a dying venom-addicted Clyde has only hours to undo a lifetime of sin, avenge his own murder, and save his godforsaken town from the human monsters he's unleashed. Yes, I have to the say that sounds like Handler. a Cody good, Goodfellow book. Well, they say write what you know. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I'm sure this is based on a true story. Personal life experiences of Cody Goodfellow. But a non Lovecraftian story. Or so it seems. It appears it is not uh, Lovecraftian. Yeah. Right, but you never the know. Lovecraftian with Lovecraftian thing ever. <laughs> yeah, you never know with Cody. He sneaks stuff in. Yeah, you can sneak in a reference to you or something. Yeah. I'm sure. All right. So you let's give away Matt's prize. What was that again, Matt? It is a complete Call of Cthulhu campaign. The sense of the sleight of hand, man. Uh, you That's very go cool. from the New York drug den to the spectral ruins of Sarcomand, from the horrors of the underworld to the zoo haunted enchanted world. 
All right, so any time between now and the 30th, you can get in on this random drawing. Just uh, send an email to lovecrafteasingprizes at gmail.com and put a uh, sense of the slide of hand manned or something close to approximating that in the subject. And I'll randomly pick someone about a week from now. So, all right, anything else before we go? Okay. Well, like I said, next week, the guys from the HP Lovecraft Historical Society, and we will see everybody next week. Thanks for listening.